Pastor Kelly. I just want to thank everyone here at Freedom Church. Thank you to my lovely wife. We're making uh, 17 years next Sunday, so give it up. Give it up for God's love. And God put it on my heart today to uh, comfort you in your weakest moments. Even as followers of Christ, sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes when you're tired, hungry, stressed, things may not come out right. The tone may not be right. So uh, anybody here ever uh, went through something and uh, didn't handle it so well? Can you? <laughs> anybody here has been hangry every once in a while? Snickers? <laughs> well, we all make mistakes, and I just want to let you know that God is bigger than those mistakes. Just like the, the uh, music, worthy is his name. Uh, and I just want to tell you that me personally, I have three modes. I'm serious, silly, and extremely angry. So I could be Michael Corleone, or I can be a businessman. So, <laughs> so I looked up some uh, followers of, of God in the Bible and uh, some mistakes that they made and how they were redeemed. And let me just tell you, it was some very, very interesting stories. It was Young and the Restless. It was Scandal. <laughs> It was how to get away with murder. It was just like, wait a minute, is this, is this David that slayed Goliath? Did he do that? You know, was this Solomon? I thought he was wise. You know, was this Jonah that disobeyed God like that? But God loved us so much that he redeemed them all. But one story that really stuck with me, or one follower of Christ that, that really stuck with me was Peter. Just because of his closeness, he was there through all of the miracles. You know, he, he was blessed over and over again and saw Jesus blessing people and speaking to people in all of the parables. And Peter was a tough fisherman. And uh, some of his story kind of resembled mine because uh, even though he witnessed all of the miracles, he still, you know, made mistakes. So uh, it brought me to this scripture, which is uh, Luke 22 and 54. And uh, coming up to the scripture, uh, Peter was there with Jesus, and it was time for the crucifixion. And Peter was there, and uh, he, he chopped off the servants of a high chief ear, so he was with it. Um, but then things got real. And, and in life, sometimes things just get real, and you, you start to doubt a little bit. You start to get a little bit weary. You start to second think of Think a few things. So in this verse, he said, then seizing him, Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. Peter followed at a distance. So even though he was a tough fisherman, he chopped off an ear or two, but he followed at a distance in this instance. And it reminds me of myself because Sometimes I follow at a distance. And when I follow at a distance, I, be I begin to hurt people. I begin to hold on to hurt. So I begin to make mistakes. So back to Peter's story, after he followed at a distance, he was in the crowd kind of watching, seeing what was going on. He loved Jesus, but not enough to just join him closely. So he denied Jesus three times. And on the third time, Jesus looked at him. And he was ashamed, and he, he wept. He was at, in grief. But after the resurrection, God restored him, and he also gave him some purpose. So given that, you know, how is God bigger than our mistakes? So I want to leave you with three truths to show you that how God is bigger than our mistakes. For one, God has unfailing love for us. So even though we may fail, even though we may fall back, even though th that we may not follow as closely as we should, he has unfailing love for us. And in the Bible, he even referenced unfailing love 39 times. So over and over again, he is telling us he loves us. He's with us. And also, he showed us on the cross that all of our mistakes that we could do, that we will do, and that we have done, he took him on on the cross, on Calvary. And he also shows us that he loves us enough to give us grace and give us mercy. 
The second truth I want you to know is don't live in your mistakes. Over and over, we're going to make mistakes, but God don't want us to live there. Even Adam and Eve, when they messed up, they was ashamed, and that's normal. But I'm telling you today that you can confess, you can repent, and make time to make God a priority. So instead of following at a distance, you can lean in. So what part of your life are you following Jesus at a distance? What part of your life that you can get a little bit closer today? I want you to think about that and, and set Jesus as your priority. Make time to praise. Make time to pray. Make time to worship. Make time to serve. Here at, at Freedom Church, we have the ability to serve and find freedom, for sure. And in the Bible, it says, walk in your newness, not your perfection. So that gives you comfort that you don't have to be perfect, but you're new through God. And lastly, I want to leave with you today is we have work to do. When Jesus visited Peter after the resurrection, he asked him three questions, sort of renewing and restoring him. He said, Peter, do you love me? And obviously, you know, after seeing all that went down, yes, why wouldn't he? But he gave him these three things. He said, feed my lambs. So with the word, we can help others. We can serve others. We can utilize our gifts for others. So we have the ability to feed the children through, this, through his word and feed ourselves. Secondly, he said, shepherd my sheep. So we have the, the, the Bible to guide us and we can help guide others for, so they can find freedom, so that they, they can find their purpose, so that they can serve. And lastly, he said, feed my sheep. So over and over in life, you're going to make mistakes. But I'm urging you to lean in, to you know, get into the word, pray, and feed yourself so that way you can feed others. I'll leave you with this prayer. God, I'm asking you to touch our hearts, that we should not follow at a distance that we can lean in. Father, give us strength to break free of shame, doubt, insecurities. Father, give us strength to repent, find freedom, find purpose, and use our gifts. Father, give us strength to serve. I'm asking, Father, that you not only restore us, but restore us, so that way we can do your will and find freedom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. How you guys doing? Awesome, awesome. Good morning, Freedom Church. Oh, wow. Can we give it up for all of our amazing speakers today? All, like, 40 speakers. That's amazing. That's amazing. Awesome. <laughs> guys, I'm so grateful to be here today giving you the word. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is John Mox, and I've had the blessing and opportunity of attending Freedom Church for four years with my beautiful wife, Michael. I've also been serving here at the kids' team for three years, so thank you, thank you. Now, I want to begin by giving some backstory on Matthew 7, which is the continuation on the Sermon of the Mount, which is the first sermon Jesus ever preached. The Bible states that Jesus went up to a mountainside in Israel to preach to a crowd of people, including his disciples, but what followed next would be the greatest speech of all time given by the greatest speaker of all time i mean that's pretty awesome right now when i think of some of the most iconic speakers of all time we have jesus always at number one don't forget that but there's people who come second best to him here we have jesus on mount rushmore <laughs> with our pastors out here at middle river pastor eric pastor pat and pastor kelly yeah, let's give it up. These right here. <sighs> yeah, let's just sit in that. Beautiful, right? <sighs> oh, man. Now, these uh, dashing gentlemen have a few things in common, but one thing that stands out to me the most is their authority and how they applied God's word in their lives. 
Now turn to your neighbor and say, authority. authority. Awesome, awesome. Now, if we know anything about the way Jesus carried himself while here on earth, it was the way that he always spoke with that same authority. Jesus knew exactly who he was. He knew who sent him, and he knew what he'd come here to do. There was no amount of backlash that would shake his strong foundation that was established with God. Now, now when Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount, he delivered it in such a way that would shape every future generation to come. He not only spoke with confidence, but with that authority, so much authority that the crowd, including his disciples, were blown away by his teaching, or as the kids would call it, peak aura. <laughs> In this sermon, Jesus includes 23 parables, but his main point was to deliver the message of love, was to deliver the message of love, compassion, and selflessness, but most importantly, that God's children are those who act like God. So in Matthew 7, 24 through 29, Jesus concludes his sermon with a final parable called the wise and foolish builders. I'll be in the NIV today. So it begins like this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down again and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as the one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. Now, after reading this passage, I have a question. On whose authority and foundation will you build your life on? Will it be on the solid rock of Jesus' teachings or the shifting sands of worldly pursuits? For me, my choice was simple, or so I thought. Now, growing up, my mom and dad weren't big churchgoers, but they were both to re- believe in Jesus. So they enrolled me in several faith-based programs like vacation Bible camp and Sunday school. But as I continued to enter my teenage years, I continued to believe in God, but my faith continually took a back seat. I went through life like a typical person, graduating from college, getting a job, buying a car, a house, all that good stuff. Just checking off a list of achievements I made myself that I thought would make me happy and successful. Now, despite these accomplishments, I found myself battling constant anxiety and depression, plagued by the thoughts like, you're not good enough, you're just mediocre, or you'll never amount to anything. I then realized that I built my foundation on my accomplishments, and because of that, I was so easily shaken by the lies of the enemy. My life to be se- seemed to be built on sand without any lasting meaning. I partied and idolized relationships that weren't life-giving, but outwardly I was healthy and successful and surrounded by friends. But when life's storms came, my foundation crumbled, and I often lay in bed thinking that things would get better, even contemplating ending my own life. My thoughts began flooding with questions like, why am I so anxious? Am I just living for the approval of others? Do I truly believe that completing this checklist will make me happy? The answer was a resounding no, but I realized that on my own, I was seeking affirmation from others just to feel good about myself. It made me feel like my time up until this point had been wasted. Now I'm gonna be brutally honest with you guys. The worst thing in my life was achieving something in success that, what, the worst thing in my life was achieving success in something that distracted me from God. Then came my harder storm yet. On April 28, 2020, just a few days before my 25th birthday, my dad suddenly passed away. Everything in my life that seemed secure by worldly standards crumbled, and my foundation was irreversibly shaken. At that point, I understood the importance of Matthew, of what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 7. When I read the scripture now, I realize that my life had been about sand crumbling under pressure and storms, causing anxiety, depression, and pessimism. But it was then I decided to rebuild my life on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. 
Thank you. Now, by focusing on his teachings and putting them into practice, I began to find true peace and stability. And now I speak with authority over my life, declaring that my foundation is in Christ who gives me strength to withstand any storm. So that brings us to the question, how can we become the wise builder and what steps can we take? As Pastor Wade said it best last month, you can't build a life of righteousness on a foundation of sin. It's impossible. And this is why foundation matters. So today, I want to talk about two key points regarding the foundation of our lives. The first one being, build your foundation on God's word. I'll read it again. Build your foundation on God's word. Now, Jesus taught to build our lives on his words. So in Matthew 7, 24 through 25, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, yet it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Now, the storms of life will always come, and this can bring overwhelming challenges where it feels like all hell is breaking loose. But the time to prepare is before the storm hits. And you can't repair a foundation during the storm. Many of us just want God to fix things in the middle of our troubles, but true preparation happens before the storm. Now, when facing adversity of a lost one, when at facing adversity like the loss of a loved one, it can be a storm that God uses to realign our lives with His will, just like He did to me. And in those moments, our foundation is tested, and we see the importance of being rooted in God's word. Which brings me to a second point. The wise follow God's word. By acting on the truth of God's word, we stand firm when the storms come, unlike the foolish builder whose house collapses. Continuously crafting your foundation in Jesus ensures you can, you can endure all of life's storms. One practical way that helped me is staying rooted in God's word is by meditating on scripture. For instance, in Isaiah 41.10, one of my favorite. It says, so do not fear, for I am with you. For do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you and uphold you with my righteous hand. This verse is a powerful reminder that God is always with us, strengthening us and supporting us, which helps us overcome all anxiety and fear. Our foundation in God's word is crucial. It's what prepares us for life storms. It's what enables us to stand firm. And it's what gives us strength to endure everything. So let's commit to building our lives on the solid rock of Jesus' teachings by acting on his truth and trusting him to be our strength and support in every season. This is the foundation you should build your life on. So let's pray together. Dear Lord, I'm just so thankful that we get to live every day rebuilding our lives on your word. We're just so very thankful for the renewal of our minds as we continue to go through life's storms and that we can rebuild on your solid rock. We just thank you for your word that's passed on for all gener- every generation to come. And we love you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much. Good morning, Freedom Church. Good morning, good morning. So my name is Jasmine, and I get to serve here on this beautiful campus. My husband and I, Jermaine, um, I'm a wife, and I'm also a mother, and last but not least, a mental health therapist. Today, I will be speaking from this topic, A Wavering Faith. If you have your Bibles, please follow me to Mark 5, 33-34. I'll be reading throughout the NLT version. And it reads... Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. So for those of you who might not know, this is the story about the woman with the issue of blood who had a real encounter with Jesus. We don't know her name or really much about her, except for the fact that she bled for 12 years. She was known as a dirty, unclean woman. And after spending all her money on doctors to no avail, Jesus was her last resort, though he should have been her first option. Now, earlier, a couple of verses back, 
the woman pushed her way through a crowd of people trying to get to Jesus, telling herself, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I can be healed. Let's start here. Prior to committing my life to Christ and getting baptized in 2021 at the Freedom Conference and going through a total deliverance process from the spirit of divination, I was dirty. I was unclean. I was living a sinful life as a party girl. I had spent lots of money on spiritual cleanses. I had no faith, but I did have anxiety and lots of it. In fact, I was the one who would call a new age Christian or a new age spiritualist. Whatever term you prefer, I wasn't a follower of Christ. I used to say things like, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. <laughs> Some would say I was doing what was right in my own eyes. I believed in spirit guides, tarot cards, horoscopes, sage, crystals, psychics, retrogrades, universe this, the universe that. That was me. Some would simply say witchcraft. I was addicted to trying to know my future. However, I had to learn the hard way that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life for me. Because ironically, I am the woman with the issue of blood. See, this past year was rough, and during one of my many trips to the hospital, I found out I was three months pregnant. And at the same time, I found out I had a rare blood disorder called autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Try saying that three times. <laughs> this disorder doesn't allow my body to produce red blood cells. In fact, they actually attack each other. Later, I will come to find out if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I could be healed. See this photo behind me? This is my beautiful family and I, minus my two beautiful bonus children who are here today. <laughs> it was taken this past Easter after service. By the looks of it, I look very happy, right? Yeah. However, I was in extreme pain. During worship, I felt a very sharp pain shoot from my back all the way through my chest. Tylenol only subsided the pain for a few hours. That's how I was able to take this photo. I will end up in the hospital after this photo for the next two weeks, hospitalized, away from my children, away from my, ba away from my baby who I was breastfeeding at the time, away from my husband who was left to take care of everything and everyone by himself. But how many of you believe that God is with us even in our suffering? Yeah. See, that's where I believe he's working in us the most, working through us, removing things from us, developing us into the woman or man of God he is calling us to be, and preparing us for the next season or next assignment he has for us that's going to require a greater level of faith. It's through our afflictions that we develop the fruits of the Spirit, and for me, in this season, it was the fruit of long suffering. For me, this meant being patient as a patient in the hospital, allowing him to work through me. It meant putting my trust in Jesus and keeping my eyes focused on him. Now I don't want things to look like on the outside because on the outside, all I could see by laying in the hospital bed did not look good for me. Possible cancer, viral infections, confused doctors, I couldn't see what was happening. My blood count dropped all the way to a four, which meant blood transfusion. However, by the grace of God, I never received one. Well, sort of, because ultimately I did receive healing through the blood. Through the blood of Jesus. Now, these were some of my issues of blood. I invite you to consider what are your, your issues of blood. I will never forget being on the fifth floor of the cancer unit. I will never forget I was given the opportunity to share the gospel to staff members who struggle with their faith. 
I will never forget the volunteer woman who accidentally walked into my hospital room but told me that the Holy Spirit told her to pray for me and she gifted me with this prayer shawl and this heart that symbolized the blood of Jesus. So just imagine with me, what was going on in the mind of the woman with the issue of blood? So many possibilities ran through my mind, so many thoughts. Thoughts like, what are they thinking of me? Why am I doing this? I am dirty, I am unclean. But then you know what? Something switched inside of her. It was like a light bulb came on and she began to say things like, if I could only get close enough to touch him, I know I will be healed. She had great faith. I believe something is switch for you today, too. So I'm going to ask you again, what are your issues of blood? Are you a man or woman with the issue of anxiety or depression or an addiction? Are you a man or woman of God with the issue of self-esteem or identity issues? Whatever it may be, your healing is just a touch away. Because Jesus is in the room today. Amen? Amen. 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 Or perhaps you're here today wondering, like, how do I push through the crowd? Not the physical crowd, but the thoughts that crowd your mind. If so, here are two key points I want to leave here with you today. Number one, fix your eyes on Jesus. See, the woman with the issue of blood was laser focused on Jesus. She showed that nothing or no one would stop her from getting close to him. She showed her faith by her actions. So take your eyes off the problem and place them on the problem solver. <laughs> Number two, be a witness. See, the woman with the issue of blood was literally a walking testimony. Everyone around her could see that she had been healed. So share the gospel. Tell others what Jesus has done for you. Amen. You see, God acknowledges us by the name he has given us, such as son or daughter, like he did for the woman with the issue of blood. He gave her identity back. So let's take a look again on Mark 5, 34. Jesus said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. In fact, ladies, the word daughter was used here for the very first time in scripture. Like how loving, how merciful was that? That he chose a woman who was dirty, who was unclean to call her a daughter. Powerful. So at the end of it all, I just want you to know that we serve a God who is ready to free you. I want you to know that we find freedom in him. The one who is almighty, the one who is all knowing, the one who is all righteous. The one who is ready to free you, dress right where you are. So where are you today? Because Jesus is waiting for you. So whether it's physical, emotional, or mental, and it's always spiritual, he's here waiting for you. He's the same God of yesterday, today, and forevermore. So leave your burdens today at the feet of Jesus because just one touch from him can and will change everything. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity you have given me to speak to your children today. Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us. Father God, you were just one touch away from us, Lord God. Touch us in those places that need to be touched, Lord God. Heal our bodies, Lord. Heal our minds, Lord God. Lord God, you are the author and the perfecter of our faith, Lord God. Strengthen us, strengthen us in those places, Father God, that we struggle in our faith, Lord God. Help us with our unbelief, Lord. Lord God, we put our trust in you, Lord. Meet us here today, Lord God. For your word says, Lord, you are close to the brokenhearted and the crushed in spirit, Father God. There is people in this room today, Father God, that needs to hear a word from you, Lord. Touch them right now, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you are and all who you are, Lord God. We thank you for everything that you're doing here today. We love you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Freedom. I love you.